Hello and good morning and a very warm welcome to today's Atlantic Burger Digital Expert Roundtable on the brink of war, Ukraine, Russia and the future of transatlantic alliance. My name is David Deisner. I'm the executive director of Atlantic Burger and I look forward to our conversation this morning. We will be addressing a very urgent and a very timely issue. The situation on the Ukrainian-Russian border has raised fears of an imminent war in Europe. Western states had recently become increasingly concerned that Russia could escalate the conflict with a military incursion into Ukraine. Moscow has denied any such intentions so far. Now, for the first time since the beginning uh, of these tensions over the massive Russian troop buildup near Ukraine, official representatives on both country, uh, of both conflict countries want to meet for talks. Uh, a meeting between Russia and Ukraine on a working level is planned to take place uh, in Paris today. France and Germany are also taking part in the so-called Normandy format. Mm -hmm. So the main goal, at least from a Western perspective, is of course uh, for Russia to end its military aggression and withdraw the more than 100,000 combat-ready troops on the border with Ukraine. Where are we headed in this conflict? What can Western Alliance, uh, the Western Alliance partners do to de-escalate? And how can or should we strengthen transatlantic cooperation in view of the crisis? We'll be, we'll be addressing these and further questions with our distinguished speakers and of course with our participants here uh, in the room. Uh, with us today is Professor Marina Henke. Uh, Marina Henke is Professor of International Relations at the Hurdy School and Director of the Center for International Security uh, here in Berlin. Uh, she works uh, on military interventions, peacekeeping, nuclear security, European security, and defense policy. Uh, welcome, Marina. Great to have you this morning. Thank you for the kind invitation. Delighted to be here. Also with us today is the retired Lieutenant General Ben Hodges. Uh, he currently holds the Pershing Chair in Strategic Studies at the Center for European Policy Analysis, CEPA. He joined CEPA uh, in uh, 2018. And as you all know, he looks back on an impressive uh, career with the US Armed Forces. His last military assignment was uh, as Commanding General, United States Army, Europe in Wiesbaden uh, until 2017. And he retired from the US Army in January 2018. Ben, uh, welcome to you as well. Great to have you. Thank you for the privilege. And uh, our moderator today is Thomas Reichert. He's the correspondent uh, for foreign and security policy at the Berlin ZTF studio here in Berlin. He held various positions at the ZTF before uh, joining the Berlin team and was the head of the ZTF studio in Beijing uh, before that. Um, Mr. Reichert, uh, great to have you as well, Thomas, if I may. Um, all three of you have one thing in common. You are all new members of Atlantic Burger. Again, warm welcome also to, to our institution. It's great to have you as experts and uh, helping us to analyze the current situation today. And uh, just one housekeeping remark. We will hear opening statements uh, from Marina Henke and Ben Hodges. Um, and then we, the three of them will join in, in, in a discussion, but also you will have an opportunity to ask your questions after about <clacht> half an hour. Thank you so much. And without any further ado, hand over to you, uh, Thomas. Thank you so much. And uh, thanks again for the um, pleasure to be part of uh, Atlantic Burke. Yeah, without much further ado, I would indeed uh, start off um, um, then with a military assessment of this situation we are facing right now. How do you look at it? How um, dangerous it is? And are we really facing an invasion by Russia? Thomas, thank you. So I think it's important to keep in mind that Russia already invaded Ukraine. This happened back in 2014. So, uh, and they still occupy Crimea. They still occupy a large chunk of Eastern Ukraine called Donbass. So what we're really talking about is the possibility of a new offensive, an expansion of what's already going there. And I think having that baseline clearly understood is important for how we deal with it and keeping in mind who we're dealing with. Um, I, th I think it's important that um, the alliance continues to stick together the way it has. Uh, I've been impressed, frankly, by the Biden administration's uh, comprehensive diplomatic effort. I, I think the last time I saw this much diplomatic effort by the United States um, was 1995. 
uh, during the Dayton Peace Accords and the work leading up to the deployment of NATO's implementation force into Bosnia. Not since then have I seen this much effort with so many countries at so many levels uh, to build uh, a unified approach uh, with our allies and other European partners and, and Canada, of course. So uh, this has been good. Uh, what we do see is a, is a transition, which I think is also a, a good move from what was deterrence through the threat of punishment based solely on sanctions, uh, to which I think is not very compelling because it, it's after the fact, which means the deterrent failed and also the chance of keeping everybody on side who was supposed to participate in these sanctions becomes increasingly difficult, especially if the uh, Russian, the next Russian attack is not a, a massive assault, but instead is a series of smaller things which will make it difficult for some countries to agree to invoke the type of sanctions like you've never seen before, which is the phrase that the White House has used. So we've transitioned now to something that's more like um, deterrence through, through demonstrated capability and will, increased shipment of weapons and equipment and capabilities to Ukraine so that they can more easily or more effectively defend themselves from the United States, UK, and several other countries. Um, and I think a, a strengthening of the a clarity of the language about what these sanctions would also really entail. I don't think there's any mistake in the minds of leadership in the Kremlin about what's coming the, the big issue is, do they believe that we would actually, that we would actually do it? Now, um, I am becoming increasingly pessimistic that there will be a diplomatic uh, solution here. I think the Kremlin has, has talked so much, this false narrative of how they're under threat uh, from NATO, um, the, uh, the amount of money that the Kremlin has spent with the soldiers deployed since last, early last year, um, the Caspian flotilla that came over back last spring, it's still sitting in Sea of Azov. The ships that are coming from the Baltic probably headed to the Black Sea. This is incredibly expensive. And, and sometimes my friends say, come on, why are you worried about? Russia has the economy of Italy. Apparently they have enough money to keep soldiers and ships at sea uh, for indefinite periods of time and to put over 100,000 soldiers on the border of Ukraine as well as what's already inside of Ukraine. So I think it's gonna be very difficult for the president of the Russian Federation to back down. Um, at the same time, uh, you see Ukraine has continued to improve its capabilities. Um, the 30 nations of NATO plus partners continue to stand completely unified. I, I was impressed that uh, every nation um, completely rejected the ridiculous list of demands from the Kremlin about what countries should do, about what NATO should do and can't do. This was impressive. Uh, the real test is going to be over the next few weeks, where I think the Kremlin is betting that if they keep the pressure on, and, and it's mounting, it's continuing, um, that this unity will crack. That at some point, somebody will say, come on, please just promise them we'll, we'll never invade, or please promise them that Ukraine can never join, and this will all be over. And of course, nothing in anybody's history should give us any confidence that rolling over for something like that would be the end of things. It would just, it just invites further pressure. Uh, and I think everybody listening today understands that. Lastly, uh, timing, of course, I, I don't, I couldn't possibly know for sure, but my sense is we're looking at probably in the next four weeks, um, right after the end of the Beijing Winter Olympics, President Putin invaded Ukraine in 2014 after his own Sochi Olympics. And I don't imagine he plans to upstage the Beijing Winter Olympics uh, and his friend, President Xi. Plus I think in about four weeks, everything will really be in place. The exercise in Belarus will have been completed. Uh, the ships that are still coming <laughs> will be here. And uh, I think that's, that's sort of the time frame. I hope I'm wrong. Thank you, Ben. That's uh, a very clear and um, actually disturbing time frame. Um, over to, to you, Marina, if I may. Um, ben said that he's very happy with at least how the Biden administration is, is dealing with it. Uh, do you share the view regarding other participants in, in this on the, on the Western side, especially mm -hmm. in Europe? Yeah, let me add a little bit of a political and maybe European German perspective to what uh, Ben has said. 
So President Biden, after his election, famously said at the virtual Munich Security Conference speech, the United States is back. And in the beginning, I think the first couple of months and then uh, what happened in Afghanistan, a lot of Europeans doubted it. But now I think um, he was absolutely right. The United States is really back. And I can only echo what Ben just said. It is a very impressive American involvement in what in the end are European affairs. Uh, but the big question now is where is actually Europe? And in particular, where is Germany? Uh, yes, there has been uh, unity. There, have, there has been signaled unity. There have been speeches. But when you look at the actual um, acts, Germany has been fairly you know, um, hesitant to a certain degree to um, go full in and show alliance solidarity. Um, and uh, one, of the, one of the pieces of evidence is, for example, that they're still holding back those export licenses um, so that Estonia can, uh, can send uh, the howitzers um, to Ukraine, just as one um, of the examples. Of course, you know, the other aspect is that uh, President Macron um, in France tries to somehow establish a European response, tries to um, get some kind of dialogue going that uh, passes via Brussels and the EU. And I think um, the meeting that takes place uh, today and then and Macron apparently has a, a talk later this week with uh, Putin, um, in one way or another tried to establish, I guess, this, this, this European uh, version. Um, I personally am a little bit uh, doubtful that this uh, can succeed, but certainly that is, is an attempt. I would like to focus um, in the remainder of my remarks on why Putin is actually uh, doing this. I think this is probably one of the big questions on all of our minds. And then as well, um, why I think, and here again, I concur with uh, Ben, why I actually believe that the de-escalation um, is um, unlikely. Um, but again, you know, I would like to add some political uh, factors. So why is Putin doing this um, in my opinion? Of course, there's a lot of talk that uh, Putin is unhappy with the current security order in Europe, that he feels betrayed, he feels betrayed by the West, that uh, NATO um, expanded despite certain verbal agreements made at the end of the Cold War, um, that uh, NATO and, and the United States is undermining the Russian system, that they are secretly or not so secretly uh, financing and helping the opposition, that all sorts of uh, color revolutions in the former sphere of influence um, of uh, Russia are um, um, have been prepared or uh, at least uh, supported uh, by the West, uh, by the United States. And now um, a red line has been crossed, and by the way, it has been crossed for a while. And um, so, you know, Russia wants to assert its power. I personally think that this is a story um, that is uh, constructed, it's constructed by the Kremlin, um, and we have to understand a little bit the timeline of when in, in Russia actually the switch of um, viewing um, NATO as somewhat uh, benevolent or at least acceptable to this outright enemy when the switch happened. And this big switch happened after 2011. Uh, and what happened in 2011, this was the moment when Putin came back, and many of you might remember that was this uh, interim presidency by uh, Medvedev. And in 2011, for the first time, Putin really faced a massive crowd in the big cities in Russia opposing his rule, opposing the Putin government, and as well opposing the, the switch back um, to Putin after um, the four years of Medvedev. But prior to that, so during the 2000s, um, Putin was fairly popular. Why was he popular? He was de facto installed um, by the Yeltsin uh, family. But then during the first um, 10 years of his uh, rule, um, he was able to gain legitimacy because there was economic growth, um, natural resource prices um, of gas and, and oil and other minerals were skyrocketing at the time. Um, so after a very turbulent uh, time during the 1990s with massive economic difficulties, uh, Russia came to a certain order, to a certain stability, um, and experienced once again economic growth and certain spheres in the Russian population experienced um, economic prosperity. All of this um, ended and the contestation to um, the Putin rule then um, grew in particular um, in the in urban um, areas and this kind of new, um, you know, one would say um, bourgeoisie, um, you know, fairly kind of uh, educated Russians. 
And here, um, Putin then made, I think, a very deliberate uh, switch to gain legitimacy for his rule and somehow keep this country together by reinforcing a discourse of nationalism, of um, reviving these ideas of the Russian empire, of, of uh, Russian greatness. And this is then when he slowly domestically started to create um, as well like the vision of a Western enemy of NATO and American Western encroachment on Russia. And this of course then, you know, um, started first uh, you know, various uh, foreign policy initiative, but, and then there was Crimea 2014, and then and Syria, certain involvement in Libya, and, you know, I think it led us to the situation right now. Um, the opposition, by the way, in Putin is still very much present. It's very difficult to gauge how strong it is, because most opinion polls in one way or another are uh, manipulated, but um, I think the Navalny movement is real and it's present. And I think it does pose a danger um, if it, you know, without any kind of um, state repression, it, it would probably pose a, a real danger to the current system in um, Russia. So um, let me briefly address as well the question where I think we are going from here and why a de-escalation might be unlikely. So many of you might remember, and Ben mentioned this as well, Russia already deployed um, around 100,000 troops last year in spring to the Ukrainian border. <clears throat> and this was in reaction to um, President Ukrainian President Zelensky's move to um, ban three television stations, which were um, run by a, a Russian um, uh, oligarch and a, a, a person close to uh, Putin. So this was the first deployment of this uh, big um, uh, troop uh, numbers was already trying to signal to Ukraine, um, your behavior is unacceptable and you need to fall back in line. And um, of course, last year, nothing really big um, happened. There is de facto involvement in Russia, as Ben mentioned, of course, um, in the breakaway um, regions and in Crimea, but no de facto escalation happened. So if you want, and Putin back down once. He uh, built up uh, you know, this uh, threat, um, but he couldn't really push further, couldn't actually gain anything from, um, from this move. So now we are um, you know, in, a, in a similar scenario, only um, the troops, there are a larger number of troops now, and there are more enablers <clears throat> there. So basically the, the, fact, the, the deployment is uh, more capable of, or at least it, it will be reaching, I think, the um, the level that is necessary to really make a, a political move. And um, to back down a second time for Putin would de facto mean that he would lose face once again. And he made the demands very clear, what he's expecting from Ukraine, what he's expecting from, the, from um, NATO, from the United States, from the West. I think these demands in large part cannot be met so the negotiations actually that are being proposed, I think they cannot succeed. Uh, so then the only option for Putin is to accept something that again, wouldn't really meet his demands. And I think, you know, judging from his, from his character and how he has proven himself um, over the last uh, 20 years, I think he's not the person who would back down once again and take this humiliation. That's why I'm pretty convinced that something will happen. The big question, of course, is what exactly will happen? And we can discuss. I have some ideas what might have happened, but I think something, something will happen. It will not just be a, a withdrawal of the forces as we have seen it um, last year. Thank you very much, Marina, for this oversight and for these um, very clear conclusions. Um, you both agree on that something will happen and in not so much time uh, um, to come. Um, ben, if you look at it at the, from a military perspective, what do you expect to happen? You said like after the Beijing Olympics, you do expect something. Um, what are the scenarios that you are looking at and what do you think is most probable? So uh, I think three or four things. Uh, first of all, regardless of what the actual new attack or next uh, offensive looks like, uh, there will be massive employment of cyber strikes uh, aimed at uh, Russian or Ukrainian leadership, 
to isolate Kyiv from uh, the front, uh, to make it difficult for them to understand what's going on or to issue orders. Um, so throughout Ukrainian society and government, I anticipate that. And of course, all of you know, uh, cyber does not recognize international borders. So the chance of spillover of cyber across Europe uh, also is a, is a real possibility as has happened back a couple of years ago when Maersk was shut down by uh, a Russian uh, cyber attack that was aimed at a Ukrainian tax office. Um, but that's going to be part of it. Secondly, uh, disinformation uh, to confuse people, to cause alarm, uh, to, to make it difficult for leadership both in Ukraine and in Europe to, to make decisions and understand what's really happening. So we're already seeing some of this with uh, government websites being hacked. Um, I think we're going to see, begin to see an increase uh, in this. Thirdly, um, I don't think that we're going to see a massive attack with all 120,000 troops coming in. You know, everybody has seen these maps that are in the Washington Post, New York Times, uh, if I said, uh, showing multiple red arrows coming in. That is a possibility. And uh, as they get more troops in Belarus, that makes it even more uh, it looks like a real threat, but um, I don't think that's the likely scenario. What I, what I think is all of those things are in place to give options, but really a much more limited set uh, of attacks uh, along the coast of Azov uh, and the Black Sea coast uh, near Kherson. Uh, these, number one, they are uh, lower risk of casualties, and I think the Kremlin is very worried about casualties. Uh, number two, they're easier to sustain uh, because the Russians will have total control of, of the water, both in the Black Sea and Azov. And number three, I think that they want to um, stay below some perceived threshold where they think several European countries would have a hard time agreeing to drop the hammer with these sanctions like you've never seen before if it's only bits of Ukrainian territory, expansion of control in Donbass, or maybe along sea, uh, the Azov coast, for example. I think that's a more likely uh, type of, of scenario. And of course, they can pause that, then they can keep going um, based on responses and, and uh, opportunity. Without a doubt, we're going to see cruise missiles uh, coming from uh, Russian Navy ships uh, going after uh, ammunition storage sites, uh, critical transportation hubs. And uh, I think in particular, they're going to be looking for Ukrainian anti-ship uh, capabilities uh, along that, that could pose a threat to the Russian Navy. So I think that's what the opening weeks um, look like. Thank you, Ben. Marina, if you look at this, what would be a diplomatic reaction or what should, should be done in this? You as an expert on, on deterrence policy, has this turns from your view broke so far? The New York Times today writes about, about Germany and especially where is Germany or, uh, and that Germany has stood out more for what it will not do in this crisis than for what it is doing. Um, so did the turns from your point of view, especially from Germany and from the European part of work so far, do you share uh, Ben's assessment on what's going to happen? So um, I think, Putin is surprised by uh, the, the involvement of the United States. Uh, he did not expect that the United States would have been so engaged in this question. Here, to a certain degree, if I may say, the Europeans got lucky, and I think actually um, Afghanistan played in our hands. Why? Because Afghanistan's de facto own was uh, military can focus on Europe in this particular moment. Um, and of course, uh, yes, uh, the Pacific is present, but China, you know, has prepared um, for the Olympics. And to a certain degree, it's uh, like uh, the United States can, Pentagon can fully um, focus on, on this uh, theater right now. And it is fully engaged. So as I mentioned before, the United States is, is really back and it's back with a vengeance. And I would say probably the, the Russians and the Putin kind of um, underestimated uh, NATO's response. Of course, his objective is to um, split NATO. Um, and Ben mentioned uh, already, um, earlier uh, that this idea of um, splitting not only the EU among uh, pro and uh, more uh, reluctant uh, uh, Putin supporters. Here, of course, it's largely an East 
question, but you know, like the Scandinavian countries are very much involved, um, with uh, Eastern Europeans um, um, on this uh, on this topic, and you know, the EU and uh, the United States. Um, I think the terms has so far worked better than um, anticipated. Let me actually build on the scenarios that have been mentioned. Um, so there's a lot of talk that Russia just might um, recognize uh, Donbass um, and Luhansk as, you know, uh, de facto autonomous regions or uh, uh, pertaining to Russia and to Crimea. But I think actually this is not really what uh, Putin wants to achieve because in the end what he wants is that the government in Kiev uh, loosens its ties um, to NATO. So in one manner, um, if he just um, takes these these uh, uh, region, it would just harden the border. I think really what what happened up here. It would I think should be only to strengthen the conviction and that that NATO and um, the Western relations are very important. So in one way, it needs to be a real shock um, to the Ukrainian government. And so um, I don't think that there will be a full invasion of Ukraine um, either uh, in the sense of uh, occupation. And then, you know, like a lot of talk was uh, that there will be an insurgency and, you know, like that the United States will be helping and fueling this insurgency. But what I could imagine are um, these uh, punitive and raids. Uh, so uh, a destruction um, of uh, Ukrainian military capability from the air, but um, potentially as well um, on land, um, destroying as much um, as possible, maybe in a week, maybe in, in two weeks time, and then um, to withdraw, but really to send and to illustrate as, as well the power of the um, Russian military, which is impressive, we can never um, forget this, and then send such a shockwave as well, um, you know, through European societies, that there might then be this fear of um, further escalations, and then we might see people going on the street um, in Berlin, in the major capitals, saying, like, this is not what we want. So I think in one way or another, Putin um, wants to shock and Awe, what the United States, you know, like um, did as well in 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 in, in Iraq just now, and um, the the Russian uh, way, and by you know like um, illustrating the massive um, capabilities that they do have to then split um, uh, and Europe um, split NATO. And by the way, um, I know it hasn't really been in the, uh, a topic of discussion, but. Russia has what is called an escalate to de-escalate um, doctrine when it comes to um, tactical nuclear weapons. I can elaborate that uh, on that if, if, if you're interested in, in the Q&A. But you know, the idea is that they could use a small nuclear device to as well set once again a red line. Uh, so it doesn't have to explode, for example, um, on uh, territory. It can be exploded in the sea, but it can send once again a signal to say, this is the red line, no further, because we might actually then risk nuclear escalation. And once again, especially in, in, in Germany, that, that, you know, like a very, um, very strong and, you know, like rightly so, nuclear opposition might then be mobilized that goes on the street and says we, we actually we want to sue for peace and we want to find an agreement and maybe then we will see much greater movement on those demands than we see before because there is this uh, public uh, pressure. Thank you, Marina. Before we open the, the floor to questions from our participants, I have a brief question for you, Ben, um, regarding the, the US view on, on, on Germany specifically. Um, is that a shared view of what the New York Times writes today um, that um, Germany again is backing out that it is um, unable or unwilling to deliver weapons, uh, even defensive weapons? How is the sentiment in, in the US there? Frustration. Uh, the Biden administration from day one has reached out to our German ally, Germany, our most important ally uh, in, in the world. I mean, the ally that we need for everything that we care about is Germany. And so I think that's why the Biden administration reached out and has worked so hard to get that done. Um, so th there's frustration and probably some disappointment. Um, and of course, this also feeds the portion of the American population that um, was so pro-Trump that said, well, you know, why are we doing this? Why don't the Germans do more? So this feeds that part of our population, unfortunately. And I have to say, um, it's for me personally, as a 
I'm the Berlin first there here, <laughs> you know. Um, but as I as I look at Germany, I don't know how Germans can claim to be the champion of European values, uh, to claim to be the champion of the uh, uh, Europäische uh, Friedensordnung, and then stand by while the Russians smash European values and the peace order of a European country and threaten and threaten others. So. I think other Europeans are, are also really getting tired of the hypocrisy. When I hear that Germany, uh, it's against the law for us to provide arms or weapons to a war zone, but yet the biggest customer of the German arms industry is Egypt, which is routinely involved in fighting with Yemen, Libya, and other places. So again, this uh, I think German credibility is really what's at stake here. Now, I, of course, I have surrounded i am surrounded by very good german friends super well educated professors doctors and and so on and i'm surprised at how many people still accept the russian fairy tale that this is somehow nato's fault and that nato is encircling russia but all of you have seen the map that shows about six percent of the russian frontier <clears throat> actually touches nato six percent um, and so the idea that somehow we are encircling russia is, is the total fairy tale. Um, I will, uh, NATO should not make guarantees, but I will guarantee that Lithuania is not going to invade Russia. I will say that today. I will guarantee that Estonia is not going to invade Russia. Um, but that, this is, this is uh, difficult for most Americans to understand why Germans seem so, I mean, I get the history. I, I understand that. But I, I think German credibility um, is eroding in front of us, which is, which is really unfortunate given the moral authority that Germany has accumulated mm. over the last 70 years. Thank you, Ben. And uh, with this, I would like to open the questions. I have three questions here in writing. And again, you are welcome to ask questions, uh, raising your hand, and then we would invite you to ask it uh, online. Um, but maybe I can sum up these three questions that we already have here because they are all going in, in about the same direction. And that is whether Andreas Rohart asked whether um, Germany appears presently as one of the weaker links um, and it's not, seems more uh, afraid of heating the bill than for Ukraine's freedom. How is this going to be compensated uh, by the Western community? Uh, Emma Brock asks whether um, Hungary and Bulgaria um, um, Orban will visit Putin on, on 1st of February, whether they will veto in NATO and especially in the, in the EU and whether that's going to weaken in the end um, uh, the, the Western unity. Whereas we have a, another question from Marco Maschek, um, <clears throat> citing The Economist, who, uh, who argues that the Russian threat has brought NATO and the Western countries closer together. Um, what do you make out of this? How is um, how is the West and how is Germany reacting to this? Maybe you, Marina. So um, let me maybe take uh, Marco's uh, question first. What can Russia really um, win? Um, I think uh, by so you know in the end uh, right now um, when you look so you know I unfortunately. Um, I'm, I'm not in uh, Russia and, uh, I'm, I'm, you know, I cannot give you uh, the, you know, like the voices from the ground, but I do think that Russia, that Putin is creating a certain um, unity in, uh, in Russia. Uh, I do think that this idea, the narrative that um, the West is evil and what Ben just said, that NATO is encircling Russia and uh, that they're even instigating this and this is uh, just an auto defense mechanism. I think the, the propaganda and uh, the information manipulation in Russia is, is, is very successful. And by and large, I would probably say that the, the average uh, Russian um, believes that story and it, it and probably supports um, Putin's policy on that question. Uh, at least this is what I gather from, from news reports and uh, from uh, various uh, friends and colleagues and contacts that I have there. So in the big picture of things, um, I, you know, as I mentioned before, I think it has a huge domestic component um, to this en entire um, foreign policy uh, posture. Um, and I think here uh, Putin is, is, uh, is 
um, succeeding, right? He is succeeding. He is rallying uh, the Russian population behind him. He's shoring up his own legitimacy. Uh, and, you know, he basically, you know, like uh, this is the only way um, or, you know, like one of the very few ways how he can stay um, in power. He and his cronies can stay in power without um, having um, to deal with a lot of uh, contestation opposition. Um, and I think that's a very, very important point that you should never um, forget. So the question what Russia can really win you answer would be um, uh, consolidate his power, his own power at home. Exactly. Yeah. And you know, what is very important, it's not just Putin, it's as well his entire um, entourage and um, the new oligarchs that he created, right? So this is uh, uh, people who are making, um, you know, a lot of money who are very wealthy. And if, if Putin would lose power, they would probably be prosecuted and would, you know, like um, face a very similar fate as the first generation of the oligarchs um, that, um, you know, we know now who then bought um, football clubs and uh, largely live in exile. Right, um, or lost uh, parts of their um, wealth. Uh, so it's not just um, Putin, but it's an entire um, uh, class um, of, of people that came to power, came to wealth under Putin that would probably lose it. Um, and they have a very much an interest in, in staying in, 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 in place and keep the, the status quo. And for that, they need to have an enemy uh, and that enemy is, is NATO. Mm -hmm. And what, what Emma Brock asked about um, Bulgaria and Hungary being uh, unreliable allies um, in, in this, um, and what Andreas Rohatz uh, asked about, again, about Germany's role. Um, if you look at, you've been already very eloquent about, about Germany's uh, role, but if you look at it from, from a wider perspective, how reliable um, and how big is that unity of Europe in, in face of this Russian aggression? Well, uh, very good point, because uh, there are multiple nations that have uh, re bilateral relationships with Russia, with China, with each other. So this is not that simple, uh, which is why Secretary Blinken uh, has worked so hard with his team to uh, with all of our, our European, uh, his European counterparts. Um, at the end of the day, what, one of the problems that we're having is that the United States and NATO and I think the EU uh, do not have a strategy for the Black Sea region. I mean, I love Ukraine. I love the culture. I love the history. And I've met so many incredibly good people. But the reason, but loving Ukraine is different from understanding this, the strategic interest of Ukraine. And the reason it's important is because of where it sits on the map. The same reason that Catherine the Great uh, took Crimea back at the end of the 18th century is because of where it is on the map which means we have got to have a strategy for the region. And, and that's how you reach Bulgaria, uh, Georgia, and of course our ally Turkey, which is the essential ally in the Black Sea region. If we had a strategy, um, then we would not be focused so much on uh, President Erdogan. Instead, we would be focused on Turkey's geographic location and the economic and military power that it potentially has. If we think of the Black Sea as a buffer against the Iran, against Islamic extremism, but also a place for huge economic potential. And the last thing that the Kremlin wants is a lot of German business or Dutch business or French business in the Black Sea region, because then the Bundestag starts wondering, why do we still have Russian troops in Georgia and Armenia? Why, why are they still there? Because that limits uh, economic development. So that's how I would address the point of Bulgaria. If we had a strategy that um, competed against Russian influence in Bulgaria, for example, and frankly, in, uh, in Georgia. Mm -hmm. Marina, I didn't want to cut you off. You wanted to comment uh, on this point as well. Yeah, exactly. So get to um, Elmer's question. My, so, you know, there have been um, uh, uh, dissenting voices on, on NATO decisions um, already in the past, and I just uh, recall uh, Libya um, in 2011. Uh, but, you know, NATO is very good at uh, finding some kind of uh, backroom uh, compromise and, you know, like basically, um, and I think this will probably happen as well with uh, Bulgaria and uh, Orban. Um, there's enough uh, leverage uh, and, and, you know, like in other um uh, items that Orban wants from the EU, you know, like for example, um, you know, EU funding and uh, and uh, uh, kind of other, uh, you know, like that the EU doesn't doesn't uh, criticize and, and mingle in, in all sorts of uh, of Orban's uh, projects. 
So I think, you know, like probably some kind of deal can be struck to avoid that um, veto, I imagine. Um, and, and I don't think that Orban will, will, you know, like pick that fight um, if there is enough, um, you know, like if he, if he realizes that everyone else is, is basically um, on board. And so this is, but I'm, you know, I'm, I'm sure you have your own opinion on this. Uh, and you're, you're working on this, on these questions. Um, Elmar, so maybe, you know, you would, you would like to, uh, uh, you know, come in here um, in the discussion and, and, uh, and, and enlighten us. Um, yeah, we have indeed a raised hand from Andreas Bildmeier, and maybe we can admit him in here and ask the question by himself. Um, a couple of questions. So one is on uh, the, the rumored Putin isolation. And so here the question is really, um, a lot has been made that he's been very reclusive in the context of COVID and whatnot. And there's a question, a genuine question whether unbiased information in particular on the probability and intensity of Western sanctions reaches him such that he can make uh, decisions under full information. Um, and I wonder whether you have, a, you have a view on that. So that's the first question. Second question is, over the last few days, Ukraine has actively downplayed the threat uh, by saying, well, the troops, that's the same as a year ago. And they have, in fact, pulled some legislation from the Rada that ha would have had a very aggressive, uh, uh, would have been, would have been, would have had very aggressive implications for the, for the Ukrainian-Russian uh, relationship. So what's the backdrop here and then sort of bigger picture how does the um, the disaster with the german or disaster sorry i shouldn't say that the incident uh, with the german naval commander a few days ago how does that play into the big picture and is that precisely what you're discussing when you're saying putin is trying to uh, split nato or uh, europe and that is so for him a big win in that context couple of questions. Maybe Ben, you head off and, and then maybe Marina. So uh, the uh, incident with the uh, uh, inspector de Marina uh, is unfortunate on two or three levels. Number one, here's a guy that served his country for decades, uh, reached the top level of the German Navy, and now his career ends like that. So from a human standpoint, for me, that's unfortunate. But um, he made the right decision to accept responsibility for terrible, uh, very unhelpful comments. And the fact that the ministry accepted his resignation immediately also reflects the recognition by the government that this is unacceptable and unhelpful. So it's honestly, it's things like that, that in one way are revealing about tensions. But on the other hand, it seems to me that there is a growing realization by the German government that uh, this can't be business as usual in dealing with the Kremlin. Now, uh, I also, uh, Andres, have been puzzled by the mixed messages coming out of Kiev. Um, you know, from uh, we're at war, we need help. I, was, I just participated in a uh, panel the other day with the current and former Ukrainian foreign minister and the current and former Ukrainian defense ministers. And even in that panel, there were mixed messages about what's going on. Um, I can only speculate that number one, there is some effort by the government to prevent panic. I mean, President Zelensky has said everything's under control. Of course, it's not all under control, but leaders are going to try and uh, reassure their population. Um, but also there is huge pressure coming from Russia in all sorts of different venues and ways that, um, I mean, Ukraine, at the end of the day, they're the ones that are going to feel the most pain from all of this. And so they are also looking for uh, ways out of it. I would defer to uh, Marina, Professor Henke, on things more specific about President Putin, if I may. Very um, interesting uh, question um, with regards to Putin, because indeed, there is a lot of speculation, unfortunately, you know, um, uh, it's very opaque, but there is a lot of speculation of uh, what type of information he um, gets and um, what the relationship is between Putin and again, you know, it's like this new, this new uh, family, this new group of oligarchs that he um, created. What you need to know is that um, uh, Putin was built up, as I mentioned before, by, uh, by the group around Yeltsin and by the first generation um, of um, the oligarchs. And then in a very abrupt and very surprising turnaround, um, in the year 2000, he basically um, uh, 
uh, got rid of them, if I just uh, may put it uh, like that. Um, he either, uh, you know, like uh, threatened them with uh, um, tax um, evasion or, um, you know, de facto told them to go into exile. And ever since, so the early 2000s, he built up a new group of oligarchs. Right. He replaced uh, the people who are renting now a gas prom and, you know, like and the electricity and uh, train and uh, chemical factories um, and so forth. And so, you know, like in some analysts um, uh, who have, uh, you know, like analyzed exactly these relationships between uh, Putin and his entourage basically say um, that it's, it's more this new oligarchy um, that really wants these uh, wars and kind of is feeding um, Putin information that might be a little bit more optimistic than the actual um, situation. But this is pure speculation. You know, I uh, um, personally have never, uh, you know, done any interviews or know exactly what's happening um, in Russia. But there's certainly an interaction between a group of people that has enormously benefited from Putin and Putin as the outward looking face as the leader of Russia. Um, but, you know, I don't, I don't want to uh, um, diminish his role. Uh, but it's more the, the societal push comes from more than just one person. Uh, and that's, of course, you know, like it's the, the big question, if only Putin was to go, would everything be fine? My clear answer to this is no. Uh, and there are many more people who have an interest in, 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 in the Russian actions and activities and policies and doctrines that are being implemented than just Putin himself. Um, but I think it's, it's very important to, to the question of... Um, uh, Ukraine downplaying threat, I think um, Ben um, is uh, right. Uh, that is the dimension of somehow trying to calm down um, the, the Ukrainian uh, population, uh, which is obviously very much aware of, you know, the entire buildup and the entire, uh, you know, like uh, um, upheaval uh, that is that is being created. And then maybe there is as well this idea of playing good cop, bad cop, uh, that, you know, like the United States is very much up front threatening retaliation. And maybe, you know, the Ukraine tries to, in these negotiations right now, be a little bit more lenient, you know, like, and reaching a hand out because, you know, as Ben said, they have the most to lose. And of course, they're interested in some kind of um, settlement. Thank you, Marina. Uh, looking at the time, I would like to, again, sum up a few questions and uh, maybe also split it up between the two of you, Ben and Marina. Um, there, is, um, there are two questions from um, Holger Fabian Saad and Tobias Peerlings regarding more um, military ramifications. So that will go to you, Ben. Um, Holger asks um, if um, um, the threat by Russia to pose, uh, pose the question on Ukrainian population centers, what is the likely military approach and circlement? If they would be at all included in a potential incursion, do you foresee a migratory wave westward? And if so, is this part of the strategic intent of Russia? And uh, the question by Tobias Peerlings goes towards um, a remark by President Biden um, that has been corrected by uh, Secretary of State regarding the minor incursions that would be acceptable. Um, maybe you can help us clarify this as well. Um, and uh, yeah, that's up to you, Ben. Okay, so uh, President Biden, of course, that was a, a mistake. It was a huge mistake and all the attention. Uh, and I, I really hate the word incursion because incursion sounds almost sort of benign when what we're talking about, whether it's a few hundred or a few thousand or tens of thousands, artillery tanks, rockets, people are getting killed, stuff, towns are getting destroyed. So incursion is... Uh, an unfortunate word, but also the president revealed what we all assume is that there are discussions and arguments about, okay, are we going to drop the hammer with the, you know, the mother of all sanctions just because Russians might seize Serpent Island off the coast or some small bit? Is that really what's going to happen? And so the White House quickly walked it back, as you said, and Secretary Blinken came out, I think, the next day and said, one Russian unit goes into Ukraine, we're going to drop the hammer. Mm. You know, we'll see. That's, that's the problem when, when, the, when the approach is deterrence based on threat of punishment versus upfront before the fact um, deterrence. Now, uh, I think we're past this because the United States has done several things to make it clear and to include the uh, alert of almost 9,000 troops back in the States on a higher level of alert status 
This is the American contribution to the NATO response force, the NRF, uh, which I like because it shows us doing this through and with NATO, not a unilateral U.S. action. Now, to the question about cities, um, I, have a, I have a Ukrainian friend that said they have family members that live in Kharkiv are trying to decide should they leave. You know, Kharkiv, of course, close to the northern border, a major industrial city. It's the home of the famous T-34. The factory is there. Um, I don't think, though, that the Russians want to get into fighting in Kharkiv. I mean, look at what happened in Donetsk and Luhansk back in 2014. Incredible destruction, so many casualties. And it's going to be that if they aim for cities like uh, Kharkiv. I do think, however, Mariupol, uh, Berdansk, on the coast, that, that is a possibility, but there will definitely be casualties. I don't think that the European Union has fairly come to grips with the idea of hundreds of thousands of refugees heading west. Obviously, most of them would head into Poland or Slovakia or Hungary. I read this morning that the Czech Republic has offered to send border guards and police to Slovakia to help in anticipation of that, but I don't know that the Union has actually gripped the potential for massive refugee flows heading west. If I may, one minute, I don't think that Germans, the average German here in West End of Frankfurt appreciates the threat to Germany. For the first time in German history, you've got only friends on every border. I mean, what a great place to be. The problem is this is not the 20th century. In the 21st century, threats come in all forms. Of course, Russia has used chemical weapons, Novichok, in UK. Uh, they poisoned the leader of the opposition, who fortunately was saved in a, in a Berlin hospital. Uh, they chased down and killed a Chechen in the Tiergarten. I mean, in Berlin, th this is who we're dealing with. Uh, cyber strikes in Germany in 2015, 2016, 2021 that we know about coming after the Bundestag. Um, these are not Boy Scouts. And so people need to realize who it is we're dealing with. They're not interested in equilibrium. Uh, they will negotiate as long as it gets them to advantage. And that doesn't mean we shouldn't negotiate. Of course we should. But you need, we need to understand who it is we're dealing with if we want to have negotiations that end <clears throat> in a way that's acceptable to all of us and that protects this Euro Gesamte Europäische Friedensordnung. Thank you, Ben. Marina, we, we seem to continue be, to be surprised by Russia's actions. They are not the Boy Scouts, as, as Ben put it. Now, uh, that really leads to a question um, I have here from um, Andreas Römerle regarding how much the German government really appreciates the threat. Um, he asked, uh, Marina, could you elaborate on potentially different strategies in the German foreign ministry and in the Kanzleram? The Baerbock and Schulz align. And if I may add, do you see, do you see this threat in the same way? Um, it's uh, my colleague actually from the Hurdy School, Andrea Romele. Uh, so she... Sorry, <laughs> Andrea Romele. Well, you know, I think um, she hit the question on the nail. Uh, so uh, there are discrepancies between the Kanzleramt and the and the um, Foreign Office, the Auswärtigen Amt. Um, I think the Greens um, are looking um, at the at the situation from a human rights perspective. Um, they are, um, of course, extremely critical of the uh, of the handling of uh, the opposition uh, by Putin. Um, and so I think uh, Annalena Baerbock has uh, here, you know, like uh, an interest of um, seeking a more hawkish. Uh, position, whereas, um, you know, and uh, I don't have uh, to tell many in the audience, uh, the SPD, um, I think, has a tradition of um, us politic, uh, an inclination to try to talk um, with Russia, try to find some kind of um, opening, try to make a deal and um, peace through uh, trade, through economic cooperation, to dialogue. I think this is like very much in the DNA of the um, SPD. And once again, I think we, we see this um, with uh, Schultz. Uh, the big question, of course, is uh, does it does it work, right? Is this the right approach? Uh, and if a lot of the allies um, don't seem to concur, um, can we, can, you know, like, uh, can we insist that we're right? Uh, can we can we um, you know say um, you know everybody else gets the situation wrong and we understand Russia um, better? Um, um, but 
you know, I think there is, interestingly, the two smaller um, coalition partners, the FDP and the Greens, I think, seem on this question closer um, than the SPD and, and the other two. Let me let me open it up a little bit more because um, we were talking about um, another elephant in the room, and that is is China with the Olympic Games. But also, we have some questions about um, about China's role in that, and the U.S. with um, the Biden administration coming into power has shown a shift towards Asia, also with military capabilities. Um, do you think, Ben Marina, this is now put into question um, uh, with Ukraine, or would it mean in the end that Europeans need to take care of their backyard or their area more by themselves? Let me start, if I, if I may. Um, so I think there has been a lot of talk of this uh, Russia-China um, alliance. And of course, it's it's a possibility, but I don't think it's it's clear cut. Um, there has been, uh, you know, like the the um, Soviet Sino split back in the 1960s when the the Soviet Union at the time refused to help uh, the Chinese um, develop a nuclear weapon. And this is something that is still very much present in China. I've spent uh, myself um, time in China. I, I studied there. I, I know the country, the politics. And quite well. Um, and now even sure, you know, like on the surface, there seems to be the ideal combination two authoritarian states, two states that contest the current liberal world order, they have a lot of things in common. But in this um, alliance or in this uh, uh, cooperation project, Russia will always play second fiddle. And this is, of course, something that Russia doesn't particularly like. And so, you know, like you can see some already contestation and, you know, like uh, conflict, for example, and um, the Chinese would like the Russians to share Russian technology of fighter um, engines, uh, so the, the Chinese still have difficulty developing their own fighter engines, uh, fighter jet engines, where they're still using um, Russian technology. And here, for example, the Russians flatly until and uh, now say um, no. Um, so to take it for granted that these of Granted, um, you know, uh, big powers that they will form a very so solid coalition, um, I doubt. Uh, but will they on ad hoc co occasions uh, cooperate? Absolutely. And can they be a thorn in the thigh of, of the West? Yes. Uh, but I, you know, I wouldn't uh, go all the way down of seeing a, a solid block um, uh, emerging um, anytime soon. I would um, add that Beijing, of course, is watching all of this very closely. And I think that if the United States and Germany and the UK and all of our allies together cannot deter President Putin from doing what is so obviously illegal and wrong and aggressive in the Black Sea region right here in Europe, then I don't think they're going to be too impressed with anything that we say about Taiwan or the South China Sea. And that, to me, this is the uh, my biggest concern about China. I, otherwise, I completely agree with Marina. I, I don't see there's this alliance, but we know that Chinese and Russian Navy units are exercising out in the Pacific or the Indian Ocean right now. Again, muscle flexing and those kind of, to make us wonder about it. But I, I don't see them. Uh, China sees Russia as their tankstelle uh, and a helpful uh, collaborator sometimes. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Marina. Um, um, there are many more questions I see here, but our time is up. We could obviously continue with that for, for quite a while, taking your all insight and expertise um, and this very, very, very insightful discussion. Thank you both for, for being part of this this morning. Thank you for all your questions. And uh, please bear with us that we could only answer a few of them. Um, thank you all. And that's back to you, David. Well, thank you, Thomas. <clears throat> and, and also um, on behalf of uh, here at the Berlin office of Atlantic Brücke, thank you, Marina. Thank you, Ben, uh, really for your analyses and your assessment of the current situation, strategic interests in the region, possible scenarios, and of course, also core elements for a more cohesive strategy of the West. And I think we all share uh, with that uh, the hope that the military conflict can be still prevented through uh, diplomatic means, deterrence, possible sanctions. Um, I, I found your comment particularly helpful, Ben, that really the credibility of the German position is also at stake here. Again, thank you so much. And uh, also to you, Thomas, for moderating and for your thoughtful questions. Enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you very much. See you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you.
Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.